This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and things you struggle with most so you can have more energy and less decision fatigue about what to eat, how to move, and so you can change your thoughts to flip 50 with the life and energy you love in this second half. And my guest today is me. I hear from so many of you that although you love the guest interviews that I do and the topics we cover, you also love, most of all, when I give you targeted content that matters to you. And so here I am. It's been a little while since I've done a solo podcast, so I'm a little rusty. (laughs) So I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to give you... The reason that body composition, knowing your body composition, your fat and your muscle numbers really matters if you want to find your best fitness after 50. And it's important when you're 20, you're 30, you're 40, you're an athlete, you're an office worker who's simply using exercise to feel better and uh, loosen up stiff hips. But it matters to all of us. And I'm going to point that out today and point out what it is, how you can get it, and what those numbers tell you. But before I do, a little disclaimer. So I am, from doing this, I'm doing a little advertisement. So I'm doing a special podcast. I am releasing one from a great friend of mine also this week. And you'll find that uh, released on Tuesday of April 24th, 2018, if you're looking for that recording sometime later with my friend Joan Rosenberg. And we really talk about the importance of emotions and what if you're finding yourself constantly trying getting against a brick wall as one of my clients so correctly puts it spot on you know when you get run over when you fall off the bandwagon and you get run over by it you know both of those things happening and you you can't figure out why because you really want the change you're initiating the change and and yet it happens you might find this insightful. It's a little off topic. It's not about recipes. It's not about the interval training that's working or not working for you. It's about, you know, what's happening between the ears and maybe maybe between the rib cage where your heart is and what's happening there that may be an obstacle. So enough about that. But I'm here to actually lead you to something a little bit more concrete. If you're still struggling to find what is the program I really need to follow that I've been maybe listening to so many voices and I'm confused. If that's you, this is for you. Let's talk about the body composition, the importance of that. A couple strong messages about listening to a single voice, finding one that you trust, and then putting your blinders on. And that's all you're going to listen to for a short time. I'd be honored if that's me. If it's not me, because for some reason I don't resonate with you. I think there's abundance in the world. There are enough people who are experts in fitness, in health, and wellness. Someone out there will resonate better with you. And I think, you know, it's my job as a professional to help expose you to them, which we do here on the show and in the blog and and on summits that I'm on. And I hope that's what you're finding. None of us has all the answers for any one person all the time. It takes a village. Sometimes your key point person in fitness will be me. And sometimes maybe if you're listening, it's not quite a great fit for where you are, what's going on with you, or simply personality-wise. We can respect we have differences and you're finding the right one. It's all good, but information that you can trust is maybe a different thing, and that's what we're going to do today is give you some more information either to take and run with or to know I need to ask more questions. So I'm going to lead you to two programs coming up in May, which means you have about two and a half days right now as I'm recording this, and then I'll put this up today. You'll have about two days to register for May is an anniversary month. And this is not to say that the 28 day kickstart, the flipping 50 28 day kickstart will be offered again. 
it's not your last chance, but it may be the last chance to get on Olga's anniversary one because I certainly hope you're not going to wait another 12 months for another anniversary. But we've been, I've been coaching for, um, since about 1996 when uh, I didn't even realize that coaching was a thing, but then went through some formal coaching uh, in 2000 and 1999, it took about a year and a half, two years to go through some formal with the way I did it on top of exercise, behavior change, um, and exercise psychology as a master's degree. And what I realized really quickly, even as I went back to grad school back in the day, was the challenges between our ears, probably as much or more than it is below our shoulders. So we first have to know what we want, why we want it, why we are motivated or, or how to get motivated to do that on a consistent basis. So, you know, it's really important to me that we are focusing on what's gonna happen, who you're listening to and making changes. So the 28 day kickstart came out of or after a lot of trial and error. So I worked one-on-one -on -one with a lot of clients and then decided I can only help one person at a time this way. How can I help more? So I tried this out in 12-week programs, um, seven-week programs. I'm not sure how I came up with that. Eight-week programs, uh, six-week programs, and finally in four-week programs. Now we do have a do-it-yourself course online, but it doesn't have the live coaching component and for a lot of us, we need that. You know, some of you, you're listening and maybe you're a self-regulator, you're a do-it-yourself, you're a let me go through this on my own time and be a little bit more analytical and methodology is really important to you. Then that online course may be for you, but for those of us who want to see change yesterday, you know, where um, a recent subscriber was writing back and forth and she said, yes, yesterday's yesterday's would be great. <laughs> you know? And I understand that, you know, when you want to see changes like, oh my God, right now, because it feels like sometimes the buttons are pushed in the opposite direction. We're getting behavior change in directions. We didn't want it seemingly overnight, probably not true, but that's kind of when it gets our attention. It's like, how did that happen? You know, I was feeling great last night, last week, last month, and then look. Okay, enough on that. And uh, I say that to illustrate, hopefully, I'm in the boat with you. I'm 54. You know, I've got some stressful days, and I've got a lot of days where I am right now sitting in front of a computer screen, very much like you. And although, yep, I get to get up and I get to, as part of my work day, sometimes create a new video for you, work on new programs, demonstrate exercises, so I can be a little bit more active. But in a getting information out there world, doing a podcast or writing books, editing the books, um, do you now know what I've been doing the last couple of hours this morning? <laughs> you know, all of that is desk time, sit time, and... Uh, you know, we all need the reminders, self-included. So I am not perfect. I'm also a work in progress right there with you. I have developed some tricks and tools. And uh, and yet I can also th beat myself up or um, to be very cliche, throw myself under the bus because I know what works and sometimes I don't do it. All right. So let's rock and roll into this. And what I hope you'll consider is if you're ready for some change and some excitement in this month of our anniversary. If you've done the 28 day kickstart before with me, reach out like right now because by Wednesday you need to be registered. On Wednesday you can do it, but don't wait to the last minute. 11.59 p.m. Mountain Time, it's done and over. Our registration closes. We will not let anyone else into the May Kickstart because I, I, we won't have time or team to manage manually giving you all the in, information. So yes, we've gotten smarter. We automate some of the emails coming out to you delivering content. Help us then answer questions. And that's where we want to be spending our time not going in and clicking send this, <laughs> this. Okay. So I hope you get that. And, you know, so jump in. 
we're going to be giving some extra things away. I'm going to do some live videos, some more exercise videos, really targeting the the more baffling things and the places where participants sometimes have the most resistance. And I will tell you this, you know, we've had great results in 28 days. Most of us can mentally, we can commit to that. And spring and summer, I think we all should capitalize on. Don't know where you are in the world, but when the lawn is a little more green, when I'm looking out the window <laughs> at baby deer, and there are half a dozen of them in my yard right now, and until probably the next neighbor goes by with a dog, it's the time to, you know, be optimistic. Things are blooming. I think we all feel a little bit more like, you know, summer brings a little ease, even if just longer days for sunlight, if your work schedule doesn't change any. So let's dive in. We're talking about your body composition and why you need to test it for your best after 50 fitness. So let's talk about what typically is recommended. We're going to test your body composition and typically when you go in for fitness testing or an assessment or you maybe are encouraged by someone delivering an online program. Most, most likely if you're here and listening to a podcast, you've done some kind of online program and or you've gone through it based on the back of a book contents. You've been told, here's what you should do. Get your weight, record your inches, you know, and take them around your calf and your thigh and your hips, your belly button, your under the bra, your uh, triceps, you know, and make sure that you're recording them. And then there may have been some suggestion to let's figure out your BMI, which you can easily do because it's based on height and weight. And that is unfortunately what your doctor will probably still be using when you go in for a physical, you know, here's your weight and here's your BMI. And they're looking for, you know, how has your weight changed maybe since last year or two years ago. And they're also looking at your BMI. Unfortunately, most doctor's offices as of yet, and I'd love to hear if it's different for you because I'll be extremely excited if it gets there, but most are still looking at BMI. And you know, your height weight ratio, I've talked about many times written in, in my books and blogged about the fact that BMI, you know, if you are petite, pardon my French right now, cover your ears if you um, don't want to hear this, <laughs> but you're screwed. If you're short, you're petite, you know, a little bit more on the five foot or under five two even I'm at five four and a half and I'll tell you that half is really important to me I don't want to be that person saying I used to be but uh, it happens we could have more muscle be the same weight or I'm sorry we won't be the same weight probably would weigh more at, at our current height and you know so fit wise more muscle less fat but BMI will be potentially worse because you'll weigh a little bit more. Muscle does weigh more than fat, it's true. So the example I've used and worn out very much, um, but I'm gonna do it again, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, Conan the Vogue Barbarian and back in his bodybuilding days, I think you can all, we can all imagine because that was, that was our day, right? <laughs> But when he was at his most fit, his BMI would have been terrible because if you're familiar and think of it, he's not a tall man. So he weighed a lot. Muscle is dense. But BMI would have been terrible when he was at his most fit, right? So body fat is much more important and much more um, information in terms of your health and very helpful right now while you may be going through hormone changes or coming out on the other end and you're not dealing so much with volatile hormones up and down changing things but you're more susceptible to muscle losses that can happen and I hope no one listening assumes or accepts that muscle loss is a natural process of aging it is not Muscle loss is a natural process of being less active. And if you don't settle for lower or reduced activity as you age, 
you can hang on to that muscle mass. And if you're 70 or 80, not exercising or not exercising appropriately, you can put on lean muscle mass. So there's your hope for the day and encouragement. Let's talk about taking that body composition or a body fat test. It's often called kind of interchangeably. What is your body fat percentage or what is your body composition? When you answer that, typically if a trainer is telling you or you're telling someone else, you're going to respond with the fat number. We also get, by default, we know what your lean muscle amount is, right, by math. So if we have your weight, we take away the percentage of that weight that is fat, we know what's left and we know what the lean is. So it's your lean muscle and your bone. And there are some testing methods, which I'm now um, either recommending to personal training business owners or personal trainers I consult with on getting um, one of them called an inline, or I'm sorry, in body, a body composition analyzer. And, you know, wonderful tool for actually stepping on. It's non-invasive. You hold onto the handles, step on top of it. So it's a little more comprehensive than one of those $50 things you're going to hold in your hand. But that too will still tell you how to get it but it will tell you what's the percent of lean and fat in your right arm, your left arm, your right thigh, your left thigh, which can be really uh, insightful. And let's say if you, you are asymmetrical, you've had an injury, you've rehabbed, and you're a little weaker, you've got less muscle mass in one leg, it'll tell you. And that's you know good information for developing a program that will help you more. Tell you where you hold the fat, because here's the the thing you want to consider is what about fat is important to you. Number one is where it's stored. And, you know, it can be stored as belly fat, which many of us are, are not liking. Anybody out there agree with that? Um, that's called visceral fat and can be more common for women who are going through perimenopause, menopause, or still holding on, on onto it postmenopause. It's a little bit more associated with higher risk of heart disease. Women who have more of an apple shape once they've gone through menopause where they didn't before they had more of a, an hourglass. So if you're finding your waistline is disappearing and it's being replaced with more fat, there are a couple of kinds of belly fat. So I want to get here in detail. One is more visceral fat where it's internal and you know you'd pat your belly and it's taut it's tight it's more like a drum it's more like santa claus and the other kind is the muffin top over the top I and mean, you can grab a hold of it and it's kind of soft and cushy and uh you know still don't like it <laughs> right but it's very different the visceral fat is the most risky for heart disease the other kind most irritating potentially um and not that visceral fat isn't. Secondly, women also deposit fat in their hips, thighs, butt, and in the arms. You know, but those are not as risky as far as heart disease. And um, so, you know, a plus there doesn't necessarily change, you know, your comfort level or desire to have it there. But it does change how you might be removing it. So the tricks and tips that deposit belly fat and remove it. The reasons you have it there and the reasons or the ways to remove are very different. And, you know, sorry about that. I've got a little puppy in the back who is making noises. <laughs> All right. And hip size bumps, how you take it off of there or you take it off of your arms is quite different than um, if you've got it deposited in your belly. And uh, so you need to be looking at, all right, now knowing this, then I have a plan that's quite different. Risk, and that's what we've addressed here, um, how to lose it. So those things, super important. So there is something to be considered as well when you're changing your diet. So let's look at um, paleo or um, ketogenic diet, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time 
defining today, but diet can have a significant effect. So in the last few days, for instance, if you suddenly reduced your carbohydrate intake, you probably experienced some water weight and you were thinking, yes, you know, I'm doing great. But if you have a few more car carbohydrates tonight and tomorrow, that number may go up again. And it's related to the way carbohydrate is stored in our body. And it's not related to fat. So you want to keep that in mind. For every one part of carbohydrate, your body stores about three parts water, which means if you eliminate the intake of carbohydrates, your body is not going to have instant access to a supply. So it's going to go to the storage of those carbohydrates called glycogen in your muscles for energy immediately because it's easy to do and your body wants the shortcut. So you'll start burning that off and you'll lose some more water weight. But, you know, do you keep it off unless you stay on a very low carb diet? It's almost impossible. So some of the keto diets perhaps you're familiar with, you know, are taking people as low as, you know, five grams of carbohydrate, which is really hard, difficult, potentially makes you feel not very well, um, depending on who you are. So I'm not challenging that. We're not going to dive into that right now. But um, I will say, you know, if you're on keto and you're medically supervised, you know, follow it, you know, and relay negative signs and symptoms to, you know, whoever is monitoring that as your healthcare provider. And, you know, know this, for most people, you know, 75 to 100 is, is low carb. If you're um, highly active and you haven't shifted over to becoming a real fat burner and taking time to do that, it takes months, then potentially you're not going to feel great. And as a woman going through menopause, perimenopause, you may feel actually worse and, you know, not like exercising or risk um, constipation, um, depending, because carbohydrates sometimes carry a lot of fiber and they can help you with elimination, which is very important. So just kind of be thinking about where you are and we're going to kind of veer off of that, not, not dive too deep. So if you, you know, reintroduce carbohydrates after a time of low carbs, you are going to gain some water weight back. You know, you want to look at that and, you know, are you suffering, you know, when you're trying to exercise with an effort when you're in movement or activity? That's also important to consider because Activity is necessary for just our mental well-being. A lot of women use it for negating their stress levels. And if you don't feel good and you're not doing it, you know, that's going to be compounding your problem, not necessarily bettering it. So realize that, yes, you can switch your body's preference for burning, um, from burning carbohydrates. That's our preference to burning fat for fuel. But it takes some time and it takes these things. A low level of exercise with a low carbohydrate intake, and it takes gradually doing that over time. So gradually increasing the intensity of exercise that you do as your comfort at higher intensities for longer periods of time becomes possible. So, you know, to shift, it's really not a matter of doing interval training. It's a little bit more about the foundation and the base of your fitness than anything else. The signs that you're not crossed over to becoming more of a fat burner or that you're exercising too hard in order to facilitate that is you have to stop when you should be doing an endurance kind of a workout, endurance day. If it feels like an interval and you're stopping and going, you're, you're working too hard to help your shift to becoming a fat burner. So a couple of things that come in here, adiponectin and insulin. Those are two hormones kind of with polar opposite tasks. Insulin kind of is that chaser to blood sugar levels go up. Insulin comes in to bring them back down and that makes us more comfortable. But when insulin does come in because potentially it has to, your blood sugars have gone up your fat storage increases and your fat burning decreases. So let me take you to the flip side of the equation. 
adiponectin does the opposite. It actually helps you burn more fat and avoid storing more fat. So we're looking to how can we increase adiponectin and decrease insulin. One of the ways to decrease insulin is have lower sugar impact, lower carbohydrate intake types of meals, and not necessarily low carb total, but lower on the impact. So you're going to have more resistant types of starches or carbohydrates. So if we're comparing all vegetables, let's just clarify here, you know, a potato, winter squash, like butternut squash, those are higher in carbohydrate. They're what we call starchy vegetables. If we're talking about cauliflower, broccoli, carrots, those are not carbohydrate rich types of vegetables. So they don't really count. You can have as many as of those as you want. You've probably been on a diet where it said unlimited vegetables. It's talking about those. It's not talking about potatoes, right? But some of those types of starchy vegetables can help with slow release of energy, kind of like a uh, delayed release vitamin, you know, that, that goes in all day. It doesn't just boom. It's all there. It's a time release kind of thing, which is optimal for energy levels. So reducing the surge of insulin is easier if you have lower sugar impact choices in your meals and you're not eating sugar and treats, you know, especially on an empty stomach or having a glass of wine on an empty stomach and adiponectin goes up by some specific tools and a little bit of fasting between meals overnight and even extending that if you've already done that and you have a very good diet, it may be worth looking at as long as you're doing it under supervision so you're not just randomly fasting. That kind of takes us back to disordered eating, you know, back in the day when we were adolescents college students, you know, or um, maybe young adults, but, you know, really have to be in a good spot before you try fasting, you know, in order to come back to a good spot. Super important. If you lose muscle, whether it's with age that you have got less activity, you have not been resistance training, you may have have lost some muscle tissue, then you'll have a loss of metabolism. So let's say if you burn 800 calories a day for your resting metabolism, that's where you are. It's just, you know, that's what it takes to get you through the day. If you lose lean muscle mass when you're losing weight, you may only burn 600 calories a day because muscle is what we call metabolically active. Fat is not. Fat doesn't help you burn calories at rest. Fat just helps you probably want to be at rest some more. So it's important that you know body composition so that if you're doing your weight and you're only looking at the scale and you're losing weight thinking, yes, success, actually what you might be looking at is, uh-oh, I have a problem. And you can correct it while you're in it as opposed to have the remorse after of no, 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 I've slowed my metabolism. It's those cycles of weight loss that includes high level of muscle loss without resistance training to put it back on that results in a slower and slower metabolism. So if I've just delivered to you bad news, it's not too late, provided you don't repeat the problem. You've got to start coming at it differently, eating higher quality foods, which for many of us are not low calorie foods. And that is the difference between hormone balance as an approach to your weight loss or best weight, best energy, best body shape. So you're feeling good about it no matter what the weight is. That's the important piece. And the ticket is controlling hormones, not necessarily calories. So if you slow that metabolism, you have to eat less and less to maintain a loss in weight. But you're going to probably get weaker and weaker and suffer more muscle loss with inadequate calorie intake and inadequate protein intake specifically. But also you're going to 
overall affected by inadequate micronutrient intake. We've learned that muscle, that bone, are affected by the whole picture, not just, you know, muscle, you have to have protein, and that's all you need to look at. It doesn't work that way. And not in bones instant is it only about calcium. It's actually about the whole thing. You need protein for strong muscles to do the exercises that give you strong bones. And we've discovered you need all micronutrients. So your body works like a machine and it needs all of them in their places, doing what they're supposed to do, not just a limited select amount. So yes, we could prioritize that. We know if you have insufficient micronutrients and we can list them specifically, then you may be more at risk for you know heart disease, for stroke, for high blood pressure, cholesterol. We have been able to link through research that people who have high cholesterol tend to be deficient in X, Y, and Z. So the flip side of that would be, so I want to make sure I'm sufficient in all those things in order to you know, avoid problems with that or potentially to recover if I do have them. So we don't want to ignore it and think, all right, I'm going to start the medication and the pill is going to make me better. Not if you're talking about, you know, medication for condition or disease or if you're talking about bioidentical hormones. The hormones themselves will not do the job if your lifestyle habits are not spot on target. So really important. Again, if you've lost muscle mass, every signal in your body will work to tell you that you're hungry or it will simply slow its fuel burning or metabolism in other words so that you don't lose more weight. And usually both of these things will happen. Though some people will lose their appetite when they've slowed their metabolism down. They're just not hungry. Metabolism, or let's back up appetite, is a good signal your metabolism is working. You're burning food. Now, it can be a lot of things. It can be cravings. It can be micronutrient deficiency. But super important that if you've lost weight that you look at a sluggish metabolism is cued off or we, we have evidence of it by your metabolism has slowed and you, you won't have as great an appetite. So we want to get that back. We want those hormones that trigger appetite and fullness to be working for you because those tips, signals, signs are good ones. Loss of appetite is not a good sign, nor is being hungry and ignoring it. And that's what's got a lot of us to where we are right now. We've done that, right? We've thought or we've heard even, you know, if your stomach is growling, if you're hungry, that's a good sign. Not true. Right. So let's talk about exercise and metabolism. So with strength training in particular, and um, this is not to say that I'm ignoring cardio. So you might be doing some type of cardio, whether that's longer, slower activity, a little bit of interval training, or ideally you're doing a little of, of all of the above. And most important, you're moving frequently throughout the day. But it's possible with weight training, a traditional weight training program where you're lifting weights um, and you're doing major muscle group work, you can expect these changes. You can lose four pounds of fat and gain three pounds of muscle in about four weeks. So this is for, for those of you who are new to exercise, it's what we can expect. Or let's say you've been randomly doing some strength training, but you have not been doing anything in a very organized fashion. This, and you change dramatically, this could be true of you as well. So it happens only with these things also present. You've got to have high quality protein intake. And by high quality, what I mean is you need certain amino acids present in greater amounts than others. So all amino acids are not created equal. We do know we have essential amino acids the body can't manufacture. We also know that if you're on a plant-based diet, 
you can get all the essential amino acids, but the challenge is you can't necessarily get the specific ones important for your muscle mass. Leucine is one that's been widely known and accepted. And there are two others that are kind of subdivisions that are really important, and they're less present in plant protein, or they're present, but you have to have almost, you know, two, sometimes three times the amount of food and calories, which, you know, not even important in terms of calories if we stay away from that, but the volume of food you would have to consume to take in that same amino acid profile is, you know, not, not even in comparison to, say, you know, four ounces of of chicken or of salmon or beef and pretty much that will cover your base for the right amount of leucine. Eggs are a great source so not for all of us can we take in all of those foods you may have sensitivities to them but that's the concern so if you're on a plant-based diet and you wish to stay on that plant-based diet you may want to supplement which is a possibility so with every meal taking you know about two uh, milligrams of leucine because you want about 2.3 to 2.5 per meal to help boost the muscle but that might be an alternative for you if you're really you know committed to a vegan lifestyle it's not missing those types of things so I want to be clear that some people will say you know you're I know you're a proponent of protein I'm a proponent of muscle and muscle for longevity and for helping women have the energy and the strength and the stamina to do what they want to and not be confused by a sudden change in their diet making them feel great temporarily but long term having side effects that are negative so I'm concerned about not just today for you but for what happens in 10 years and 20 years making sure you're not losing muscle long term so that you can do the things you want to. We're the first generation, you know, and there are some instances of, you know, vegans who will live forever and they're very active in lifestyle. And I think what you have to look at is, are they active in the way that you today want to be active, you know, as you're looking at? Where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing when you're 90? Is it acceptable for you to be in a place where you're slowing down, you're doing less activity, or do you still see yourself doing triathlons and road races or playing golf or whatever your your go-to passion is in terms of activity. Look at the way you want to live and how you want to keep it. This, you know, kind of insight about benchmarking, you know, now at whatever age you're at, say you're at 50 right now, benchmarking again every year. What's my lean muscle mass? What's my fat percentage? doing it again at you know 55 and at 60 and those big markers will also tell you is there a pattern here and how can I right now reverse it so that the challenge is you may be reluctant it's not you know something you can do right at home although it is right <laughs> so your bathroom scale right if you're ever buying another bathroom scale don't buy one that doesn't do body composition it should tell you weight and percent body fat and, and then go out of your way, you know, once a year at minimum or now and then three months from now and six months from now, go out of your way. Go in and have your body composition analyzed, ideally on the same instrument, the same tool is used and the same administrator is used. That may be less important if you're using, say, something like InBody, and this is no commercial or advertisement for them, by the way. But I do love that it's non-invasive, it's comprehensive, and you know really gives you insight about what's going on all over through your body pretty quickly. You can get a printout that you can compare, and what you've got from that is a game plan for some goals and how to change things. So super important. Without tracking your fat weight and your lean weight, you simply don't know if your diet or your exercise or both are hurting or helping your long-term fitness and health. That's the bottom line for today. After 50, you have a lot less time to be guessing, right? So, you know, our muscle mass peaked 
at about 25. Bone density peaked about right there as well, and kind of some of us will flip flop that. But you know, at about 30, we start withdrawing from the bone bank and we start losing muscle much, much easier if we're not doing something to counter it with good protein and um, high quality resistance training exercise. Those things are super important. So we want to get spot on, right? So we want to gain lean muscle and it requires a focused program. There's some specifics. It can't be random. I'm lifting weights today. I'm kind of doing this and that. And the other thing, nope, you've got to really be following some protocols. Some of those I mentioned in hot, not bothered, directly tied to studies that have come out pretty recently. And all the studies that I mentioned in that book, with the exception of one or two that I let you know about and why I included them anyway, our subjects in those studies were women in perimenopause, menopause, or postmenopause. And that becomes really important. So if you're following a program, you're following a trainer who developed a program based on young, athletic, fit males in their 20s, right? Or even athletic females in their 20s, the rules are not the same for you. So it's time that we really get focused on what works for you, for me, when you're in your 50s, your 60s, or 70s or beyond. You have less of the hormones that help you, so you've really got to optimize them with the right activity and nutrition. You have more opportunities for stress hormones that interfere. So again, You've got a, a couple things that could work against you, but if you know hormones and you know what should happen and what can happen, you are much more in control of being able to watch for signs and reroute, re-navigate, if you will. So in summary, what you want to do is make sure you're getting tested for body composition and you know what that is and you're regularly retesting weight and body composition. And the best rule of thumb would be anytime that you're weighing, record that body composition as well. Make the most of your exercise time once you've got that. Reaching fatigue with strength training, for instance, not doing muscle wasting kinds of activities like long, slow jogging over and over. Give your exercise purpose. Make your exercise nutrition help you burn more, not store more. You've got to be careful with some of the things that you're taking in. Put simple daily habits to work for you. So simply getting up, going to bed, the routine you have at those two times, those first two and last two hours of the day can be extremely um, game changing, if you will. Test and don't guess. Your muscle mass and your fat mass can't emphasize that one enough and realize that you've got to keep your eye on the right ball, right? And stop crazy online research. When you get advice from a voice you trust, follow it. So I would suggest that you find a voice, if not mine, and, and then eliminate you know, all of the, this is working for somebody else. Here's what they're doing. What should I do? And, you know, realize that sometimes that little voice in your head is just wrong. It's based on, you know, a recording that got set a long time ago. And it's like, you know, a vinyl album. I know they're coming back in vogue, but, you know, eight track cassette tapes then, if you will. And, you know, there's better ways to listen and there's better messages that you can get now. And you've got to realize I'm catching myself defaulting to what was true or what I learned was true when I was 20. And the research has changed. My body has changed. My hormones have changed. So the same thing are not going to work. And remind yourself, if you have evidence, something's not working. You got to keep reminding yourself of that logic because emotions, you know, really can take over. Fitness and exercise and what we eat are all emotional. So it gets a little tricky to make good, smart decisions. So here's my last reminder. The 28-day kickstart, the information or the chance to get in closes Wednesday of this week, April 
5th at 11.59 Mountain Time. Do not push it to the last minute thinking in your time zone you were correct because I cannot let you in. But this is a great program to get into. If you've done it before, you have access to it for as an alumni for 50% off because I'd love everybody to come back, do a refresh. And if you have over 20 pounds to lose, the 28-day kickstart is still an option for you, but I would highly suggest the Fit You program because it's so much more about really fat burning and making sure that you're not just focused on the scale because if you've got 20 or more pounds to lose, chances are that you've, you've started and stopped multiple times and you've got some ideas about what you need to eat and when or maybe haven't addressed when and you need some very specific content. So I would certainly suggest do fit you instead and it's a better option. You still get access to me live for eight, actually nine weeks while you're in there and you stay in the group as long as you like. So I'd love it if you would submit a question. If you've got one, leave it below the show link and you'll find this show at flipping50.com forward slash podcast. And it's really urgent, right? If you are listening in April of 2018 to go and get in and take advantage of those links right now. And if you're listening later after the fact, those two programs will still be there. It just won't be our birthday. So join us on the Facebook page at Flipping 50 TV. That's the URL. And to get all the juicy resources and links mentioned in the show notes, visit this, this episode at Flipping50.com forward slash podcast. And last, just a little plea. If you enjoyed the show, if you're listening regularly and downloading it from iTunes, if you would leave a rating in iTunes, it will really help us out. And I'll leave the link here. And then share this with a friend to surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. What are you waiting for? Let's start Flipping 50 today.